The Alcacer Murders, Part 1, The Disappearance Warning, don't Google this case if gory images upset you. On November 13, 1992, three girls from Alcacer, a small town in Spain, disappeared from the adjacent town of Picasent. Their names were Antonia Tony Gomez, age 15, Maria Deseada Desiree Hernandez, age 14, and Miriam Garcia, age 14. Police say the three friends were headed to a class party at the Cooler nightclub. Witnesses would report seeing them walking and hitchhiking in the direction of the club, but they never made it there. They were last seen getting into a car with four men about a half a mile, one kilometer, away. Two and a half months later, two beekeepers made a gruesome discovery the bones of a human arm were protruding from the ground, still wearing a wristwatch. After some debate over whether they should report what they'd found, the two men went to the civil guard, police, Station. Thus began an investigation that would be full of mistakes, incompetence and accusations of cover-up from the start. Police allowed the two beekeepers to collect evidence at the scene. They failed to take photographs before collecting evidence from the area. Few photos and no video was taken as the bodies were removed from the pit. No one saw the civil guard police officers, the judge or the judge's assistant taking notes for the reports they'd later file. Many important items of evidence were left behind at the scene, tossed out destroyed or lost. Not only had the girls been murdered, they had been tortured mercilessly and raped before being killed. Their autopsies seemed to bring up as many questions as answers. One of the items found at the scene was a ripped-up medical paper bearing the name of an Enrique Engels. Although Enrique had never been in trouble with the law, his brother, Antonio, was well known to police. Soon Antonio would be Spain's most wanted man, while police interrogated and formally charged his friend Miguel Ricart who had lived at the Angles family home with him. Antonio, according to the police, would make an escape worthy of Hollywood, go on the run and slip through the officer's fingers every time they were closing in on him. To this day, Antonio Angles has never been found. With no Antonio, police focused in on Miguel, who issued a written confession. Six different times, seemingly every time new facts emerged that his previous confession didn't mesh with. Ultimately, Despite many questions about the validity of the confessions and no other evidence tying him to the crime, Miguel was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Case closed, right? Not quite. There's so much more to this rabbit hole and I want to share it with you. I've been inspired by the awesome multi-part write-ups on Ben McDaniel and the unresolved podcast episodes about the Alcacer girls, he also did a write-up here. Events of note before the disappearance About one week before the girls disappeared, there was a frightening incident involving Miriam. She was taking out the trash at night and as she descended the stairs of the common area of her apartment building, the overhead light went out and a man wearing a balaclava emerged from an unused elevator shaft. The details of what happened next aren't clear, but Miriam put a stop to the whole thing when she threw the trash bag at the man and ran away to a phone booth, where she called her parents for help. I wasn't able to find out if the man came towards Miriam, tried to grab her, threatened her, or what but she escaped unharmed. No one is sure whether this incident had anything to do with the murder of Miriam and her two friends a week later, but her mom believes the man was just a thief, intent on robbing Miriam. About a month before the girls disappeared, Miriam had started vocational school at La Florida Onsti 2 in the town of Catadao. Catadao was home to Antonio Angles, who would become a suspect in the girls' murders. A week before disappearing, Miriam's teachers at her new school had organized a camping trip so students could get to know one another more. Miriam went on the trip and her mom picked her up at the train station afterwards. Shortly before the disappearance, Miriam had opened her door to find some Jehovah's Witnesses interested in converting her to their faith. They offered her a book, which she accepted. She had been reading it in the days leading up to the disappearance. Friday, November 13, 1992 The following is a summary of witness sightings. The times given are according to each witness' own individual claims. At some point the afternoon of November 13, these had no time given. Desiree's mom says Tony came over to meet up with Desiree. She gave the girls some cookies and they left together, seemingly in good spirits. Miriam's brother, Fernando, said the day he'd asked Miriam if she was going to cool her and she'd said no. That afternoon, Francisco Antonio Soria, a friend of the girls, asked Desiree if she and her friends were going to the party at Cooler that night. She told him no, that they were not going. Francisco Antonio Soria Chavali. Summary. Folio 656. Pick a cent. November 20, 1992. Oddly enough, Francisco would change his story when he testified at trial four years later, 
saying he didn't remember asking Desiree if she was going to the party. It helps a lot to see a map of the area when retracing the girl's steps that night, so I have created one for you. I've taken the locations mostly from maps made by Overdrive 1979, who posted tons of Alcacer case info here. I highly recommend checking those posts out they've got a lot of info and photos. All of the following witness times and claims are taken Juan Ignacio Blanco's book, What Happened at Alcacer. I'll call it Jib for short. 6 p.m. The mother of Esther yes, a friend of the three girls who had the flu that night, said Miriam, Desiree and Tony came over to visit Esther at their home in Alcacer. She stated the three girls left around 6 p.m. Esther stayed home because she was sick. 7.45 p.m. Francisco Antonio Soria, the friend who'd asked Desiree earlier that afternoon if she was going to cool her that night, ran into the three girls in Alcacer. He only briefly said hello, because he was on his way to a graduate exam. I confirmed with my resident Spaniard that nighttime school classes are a thing in Spain, so Francisco Antonio isn't necessarily lying about going to an exam on a Friday night. 8.15 to 8.20 p.m., Esther just stated that her friends came over, but that they left at a much later time than the 6 p.m. her mother had given. Esther said her friends left around 8.15 or 8.20. She said she knows this because she looked at her digital clock right after they left. According to Esther's statement to police, her friends intended to go to Cooler. 8.15 p.m., Esther received a call from Marissa, a friend of all the girls. Marissa was asking where Miriam, Desiree and Tony were and whether they were going to the party at Cooler. Esther told her she didn't know. Marissa then said she would go to the Zoss Rec Center to see if they were there. Esther did not tell her what she claimed she already knew that the three friends were in fact headed to Cooler. 8.15 p.m., 21-year-old Francisco Jose Arvas and his girlfriend, Maria Luz Lopez, saw the girls sitting at a stoplight at the edge of the Alcacer City line. The couple disagreed about whether the girls were hitchhiking. Maria Luz insisted they were, although she said they were doing it shyly. She said they seemed nervous about it. I think what she meant by shyly is the girls were nervous and selectively hitchhiking, only signaling if they liked the looks of the people in the car, but I couldn't find clarification on her comment. They picked the girls up in his car but couldn't take them all the way to Cooler because the car was leaking fuel and needed to go to an auto shop. The couple let the girls out at the Mari gas station, now called Repsol, in Picassent. Maria Luz said in her statement to police that the girls said they were going to Cooler, and as they watched the girls walk away, that appeared to be the direction they were headed. 8.10 to 8.20 p.m., Jose Antonio Cano, a 16-year-old acquaintance of the girls, reported seeing the girls walking in Picassent in the direction of Cooler. He had just left Cooler himself and was on his motorcycle, headed to the town of Sheila. 8.15 p.m., Maria Dolores Pedal reported seeing the girls hitchhiking on a corner opposite her apartment building. A white two-door car with four men already inside it pulled up and she watched the three girls pack into the car with them. The car drove off towards Cooler. The corner where the girls got into the white car was immediately in front of a prison building. Two blocks further down the road, in the direction of Cooler, was the Picassent Civil Guard Police Station. The Badal sighting was the last time anyone saw the girls alive. So, what do you think? Do you believe all the witness statements? What about the time some of them have given? What do you think happened to the three girls, aka the Alcacer girls? Many have expressed disbelief that the girls would go to Cooler when they had no tickets, no money, no ride there and had a curfew of 9.30 p.m., so, almost no time for the party. Do you think the girls were going there? Someplace else? The girls seemed nervous about hitchhiking. What do you think made them okay with getting into a car with four men in it? Do you think the girls knew their killers? Awesome write-up. You did a great job of laying everything out in an easy-to-follow timeline and got it all across perfectly. On a side note, I'm the dude behind Unresolved, and I really appreciate you linking the episode's write-ups in your post. This was one of the largest rabbit hole cases that I've ever gone into, and there's so much material I left out which makes me really happy that you're doing an in-depth analysis. Awesome work. Every point seems to have something out of order. The random piece of paper which links to local drug thugs who magically become the prime suspects. The number of times witness stories change not just about minutes on one side or the other, but of whether or not the things they said before were even factual. Five sets of parents. Counting the girl who called and the one whose house they were at, and not one of them offers the five-minute drive to what would have been known as teenage party spot? Now I'll be back at 10, be already outside. And these questions are after I just read four to five entries here and on other link pages. The random piece of paper is a hotly debated issue from what I can tell. There was a lot of wind at the time and some say there's no way those pieces of paper stayed there so long. I know, it's so sad they couldn't get a ride from a parent. From what I've gathered, 
Some of the parents didn't know what the girls were up to. One of them called and asked her mom to get her dad to drive them, but the mom told her no. He had the flu, later that mom said she didn't think her daughter would still try to go after being told no. Evidently she felt her daughter would have given up on the idea. I have nothing to add about the case, you did a good job, but I'd like to mention that Picassant and Katadao were also mentioned in the Macaster murders. While I believe that two of the Macaster kids died because of an overdose, the third body believed to belong to Pyler, was a murder, and was found not far from where the Alcacer girls were buried. In fact, Rickard was questioned about Macaster either by the police or by journalists, although he denied being involved. If there is ever a place for an organized group of bad people to find a target of opportunity a road leading to a club targeting young people traveling alone would be it. That it is clearly the main drag probably also means store lots and the like where a group could hide relatively out in the open, kids driving to a spot and maybe doing a little pre-club drinking. Messy spot even for good investigators, which these were not. With another friend calling looking for them and a mother of a fifth girl saying they were together, I'd say yes they were going to the party. But things about this fifth family are the ones off from every other witness. Mom saying they left two hours before. The girl giving a specific time 815 to 820 and a reason for that specific time contradicting three other witnesses who have the girls the 10 to 15 minute drive away, of course reading 800 as 820 if you are a day or two later thinking of missing friends is not impossible. Telling the friend I don't know where the girls are also sounds strange unless you take into account said friend then went to a rec center to find them. The three girls didn't want to go to some structured youth center, they wanted to go to a club. Too long, didn't read, a targeted strike of opportunity sounds the most likely, which means investigating any other attempted attacks in that area on club nights. First off thanks for the excellent write-up on this case. I've gone down this rabbit hole so many times and every time I come out more confused than ever. Even the time their friend's mom told the police was a whole two hours difference than her daughter's? None of it makes sense. I was also a teenager once, so I truly believe the girls were probably going to a club instead. Damn, I don't know. I do know this is just a heartbreaking and mind-blowing case. I will look forward to your next entry. I know what you mean. There are so many inconsistencies. Some of them I'm sure are innocent, but are all of them? And with all the mistakes the police made, it gets harder and harder to believe they weren't covering up for someone. What really gets me is the scale of the murders and the cover-up, if there was one. DNA from 5 to 7 people was found on the girls' bodies and that was after their bodies had been washed. Then if the police were involved in covering it up, there had to have been some coordination between more than one person to do that. One freak sadistic murder is one thing, but five to seven? And all working together, too? It's very hard for me to believe, but obviously some level of coordination happened. Interesting right up. There is another thread about this murder and after reading that I googled about the case a bit. It's kind of a rabbit hole and I have basically two theories on what may have happened. The girls were killed by a group of rich, dangerous, powerful people and there has been a cover-up, strength as in numbers, a large group of locals did it and they helped each other to cover everything up. I hadn't thought about a group of locals doing it. Certainly, it's just as likely the perpetrators were locals as it is that they were from some other area. A lot of people think if there was a cover-up, the killers must have been very rich and powerful. I've seen all kinds of people accused of participating in this crime, from police to drug dealers to the King of Spain himself. There doesn't seem to be much evidence for most of the accusations that have been thrown around, though. I'm from Spain, this happened when I was 6 to 7 years old, and grew up hearing about the case, the trials took place in 97 and 98. This is a rabbit hole I've been into for years, reading all I can. Wanna know my take on it? None. I personally cannot err on any particular side with a minimum of confidence. The official version has many gray or even dark areas. But the many conspiracy theories that have surfaced over the years have marred the debate with ridiculous statements, ungrounded accusations and all kind of wild, Hollywood-esque plots. And now there are lots of stuff around the net with dubious veracity. That's why I personally don't like talking about El Casar anymore. It feels like navigating a catacomb while blindfolded. There's a good multi-part podcast episode of Unresolved on this case. Do you think it could be related to Virginia Guerrero and Manuela Torres going missing? 23rd of April 1992 versus 13th of November 1992 gives whoever did it some time to convince themselves they got away with it and to travel from Reynosa, also a small town city with a similar population to Alcacer, to Alcacer. I think in their case they were also seen getting into a white two-door car.
I hadn't heard of those cases now I want to read about them. There were a few cases I heard about that people suspect might be related to the murders of the Alcacer girls, like Christina Mercedes Yorca and the three teens in the McCaster murders. I think if the case were linked to others, it would provide more information to catch the perpetrators. Sadly, I don't think the people who killed the Alcacer girls were first-time killers. What they did was just too far out there. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. What do you think happened to the Alcacer girls? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Alcacer girls. Share your thoughts in the comments below. Alcacer girls.